Well, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody for being here. And I know everybody I think is getting kind of tired and um, you know, in the routine of this new normal. And so we really appreciate um, the people that are that still are joining us. And we really, again, we're trying to make this really um, tailored to kind of the current situation and helpful um, for what you're going through. So today's gonna include a lot of discussion. Um, and, you know, again, hopefully it's helpful to like connect with each other. Um, we're gonna talk about, um, oh, I can't advance. <laughs> um, Self-care, which I feel like, um, you know, is always sort of just like a um, catchphrase and everyone just said that this is important. And um, Michelle and I were talking and we were saying, you know, it's really, it's actually feels like it's, it, it really, it's not a joke anymore. Not that it was a joke before, but like you actually truly really need um, to be thoughtfully thinking about self-care and um, actively taking steps to incorporate things into your routine. And that's something that, again, I thought I always took care of myself, but I feel like I've had to really um, be thoughtful and deliberate in doing that. And so we're hoping that you guys can share some of your ideas and some of the things that have been helpful for you um, during all of this. I'm just gonna have a quick check-in as far as um, what's going on with um, COVID-19 in your communities and kind of how your, your districts have already been doing such a fantastic job, but if there's any new information or updates that would be helpful to share with the group. Um, and then we're going to do a quick summary of the previous sessions just so that we can kind of remember what we've um, talked about so far. It's really morphed over the course of um, this, this series and um, we were almost forgetting too what we talked about at the beginning because things seemed so different. Uh, but we wanted to just kind of quick, give you a really, really quick summary so that we could kind of take, have those takeaway points um, that hopefully you can take away from the series. And then again, we'll have that self-care discussion at the end. Okay. Um, all right. So let's just do quick introductions because we've got a few of you here today. Jennifer, do you want to start? Sure. Jennifer Elson. I am a elementary counselor in Ellis, Kansas. And the biggest change that we've had here is um, it, this past week, because uh, I actually live in Hayes, this past week, our school district, the school district in Hayes had to shut down their lunch service oh, wow. because one of their uh, lunch workers tested positive for COVID. And so the town really rallied together. So what, what have they done then? And is there a replacement for that or? Um, a bunch of the businesses, um, like our downtown uh, businesses and our Chamber of Commerce and the school district worked together and we had a bunch of different restaurants in town um, work together to get the kids food. That's a really cool story. So they were still able to get lunches and stuff. Yeah. Very cool. It's really neat to see like every you know everybody rallying together and um, towns and communities and um, so thank you for sharing that because I know that's really important. Um, I think it also highlights like the you know the hard work um, of the people who are that front face of handing out food and things like that and that they can also be at greater risk um, you know with doing some of that and I think that it's incredible that people are still choosing to put themselves in that position because they want to serve the kids and families in their communities. Well, and that's what I was helping with handing out the lunches in Ellis and I got shut down from that. They scaled back completely to just a skeleton crew to handle the work because they were worried about too many people mm -hmm. being exposed. So my whole thing of getting to see the kids every day and kind of working with them a little bit through that went away really fast. Which is hard for you too. Like if yeah. you, you know, you were trying to keep that connection and it's harder than you think. So, yeah. um, okay, well that, that is a, that's a pretty big update. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have Kara, do you wanna introduce yourself? And Hey guys, um, I'm Kara Schwint and I'm the Director of Learning Services from Haven. And actually Beth Bluebaugh invited me today, so I kind of was just checking in and going to see what this was all about. As far as COVID in our community right now, we are still going strong with our lunches every day. Um, I know our staff is definitely taking those precautions of wearing the masks and the gloves, um, but we're serving our communities and um, our teachers are doing an amazing job of reaching out to kiddos. So um, I think we're handling it pretty well. We've had really positive feedback as far as everything has went. 
That's so awesome. Thank you for being here and thank yes. you for sharing. Um, we'll say it over and over again, but we've just been so impressed and inspired and in awe of educators throughout this whole thing and hearing your stories. And, um, you know, I have a second grader and just like how his teacher has stayed so connected. And it's just really, really um, in such a hard time. It's really inspiring and, you know, um, energizing to hear like just how innovative and creative that educators are being. So um, but they've, they've done such an amazing job. I mean, and that's, you know, I'm on a blog for all Kansas teachers as well. And just the way they have all come together and tried to support our kids and our families and that grace that they're showing. Um, it's just, it just makes you feel so proud to be in that community where teachers are trying their best to do what they can and help families. So it's been pretty cool. Absolutely. And it just shows again how the teachers are so much more than, I mean, educators even, you know, as far as I just think it brings such um, consistency to their day and that social connection. And, you know, it's about the the work, but it's really not, you know, it's so much more than right. that too. And I think they've done such a good job with that as well, which has been really neat to see. So um, thank you for sharing that. So we've got several people jumping on. So we're, we're glad about that. It looks like I'm going to move to Laurel. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Laurel Scott, and I actually was invited by Kara and Beth as well. Mm -hmm. I am in an interesting position. I am transitioning from USD 259 in Wichita uh, to Haven um, grade school and where I will be the principal. So I'm just here hanging out, uh, listening and learning from you guys, and I'm really excited to be here. So um, as far as uh, our community uh, in Haven, just watching and learning from amazing teachers and seeing how much they're willing to give and push themselves out of their comfort zone uh, to accommodate for students in these very strange circumstances, being willing to say, I don't know how to do Zoom, but I'm willing to give it a go and let's try it and then say, that was awesome. Let's do it next week too. So it's mm -hmm. been cool. That is awesome. We're so glad you're here. Thank you for joining us. I am a Wichita. I don't I probably told you guys that a million times, but um, so any Wichita like people around there kind of I'm, I feel connected. <laughs> so, all right. Um, Kathy, do you want to say hello? Hi, I'm Kathy Lorino and I'm a school social worker in Shawnee Mission at Rushton mm -hmm. Elementary School. And, you know, even with us being this many weeks in, I think I'm still trying to find my feet and my role. And um, it's been challenging, very challenging. I kind of think I was like, okay, this will be kind of cool. I have eyeball headaches from staring at a screen, mm -hmm. like being in meetings all day long. Um, it's, it's harder to be still in one place than I even though I'm at home than I thought it was gonna be, for sure. I am right there with you, Kathy. And I actually just um, found this article um, like psychology today that was talking about how draining um, Zoom and like virtual meetings are and how they're so much more exhausting than regular meetings. And um, it has like five reasons why. And I was like, yes, it's not just me. Um, but it, it was really interesting talking about how like sort of the social rules are different and it's really hard to like kind of anticipate those. And you have to kind of, I feel like I have to over exaggerate my nonverbals because you know, you're not in the same room. Um, and I'm totally there with you with like the sitting in one place. So you can't, I mean, I'm usually up and down all the time. So um, it definitely is really hard. Um, yeah. I, I thank you for sharing that because I totally agree. All right, um, Nancy. Good morning, I'm Hi. Nancy Perez. Um, I'm at Russian with Kathy actually. Um, she's our social worker and reminded me of this meeting <laughs> this morning. Um, so yeah, we're in Mission, Kansas. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here. And then Beth, are you able to say hello? Uh, I really appreciate the, all the people you've invited today. <laughs> yes, I'm here. Um, I am the therapist mental health liaison for uh, two districts, for Pretty Prairie and for Haven. Um, and I'm happy to see that four of us from Haven are on here. So look at us go. Um, things are still going really well for both districts. Uh, both districts are still doing lunch programs. Um, both districts have worked to secure some hotspots and internet for people who need to do online. Both are doing hard packets for those who don't have um, online capabilities. Um, both have passed out 
various devices so that everyone can have the tools they need to do things. Um, in Haven, they're going as far as having um, some staff members help deliver meals um, for those who can't come to the pickup sites. Um, they've done videos to keep uh, families connected to the school. So I think things are going really well for both districts. That's awesome. Thank you again for being here and for inviting people to join us. Um, and then Rachel. Hi, I'm in the middle of possibly reading a book to my daughter. So if she says something, she That's just okay. wants you to read Yeah, we like that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm a counselor at Haven Grade School, and um, I think things are going pretty well. I sent out a check-in survey to all my students, and I think I've sent back about 90 four or five emails <laughs> um, with students who've responded. So that's a ton of emails and um, the optimistic side of me is loves that students have engaged and I've been able to connect with them even though we aren't seen together. And the, the side of me that can get down about all this usually then just gets mad that this is how I'm having to talk to my students at all. Um, mm -hmm. And I just wish I could see them and give them a high five and yeah. uh, have them drop by my office. So um, but anyway, I will choose to be optimistic this morning about it and <laughs> glad that I got to send, um, send that many follow-up emails back to every student and, um, lots of emojis, lots of emojis <laughs> <laughs> with my littles, but, uh, yeah, that's kind of what's going on in my world. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. And, um, I love that you did that. It's got to mean a, a lot to those students, just those little, like those little messages, I'm sure mean a ton. And so, it's a lot of time, but um, I know it probably means the world to them. So, and I and I think that um, Dr. Swales has talked about this in other presentations. I don't know if she talked about it here, but the idea that it's okay to feel two ways about something. Like it's okay to feel kind of heartbroken and exhausted, but also you know inspired and optimistic. And um, I think that's really normal right now. Um, but it's kind of a weird, <laughs> a weird place to be. So again, thank you guys for all being so open and sharing. Um, that. And I realized we didn't introduce ourselves and some of you guys are new. So um, I am Skylar Bellinger. I'm a psychologist at um, KU Med Center and Pediatrics and I'm part of the Telehealth Rock School Grant. So um, I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Lenny Swales. I'm also a psychologist at KU Medical Center, um, also on the Telehealth Rock Schools Grant. Um, and uh, I really enjoy the opportunity to connect with so many people across the state through this ECHO series. So I, um, it's been a wonderful learning opportunity for me, and I really appreciate everyone's time and commitment to it. I'll just go down my Alice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Alice Zhang, and I am a Lent and Telehouse Rocks uh, postdoc fellow. And uh, it, it's really, uh, I feel like although my, my job is not a teacher or counselor at a school district, but some of the things and uh, difficulties, ch challenges, or like those emotions are really similar as we are working through this uh, really um, uh, difficult time. So it's really a great learning opportunity to have spent uh, all these sessions with you all. And then Katie? I'm Katie Tepper. I'm a psychology postdoctoral fellow at the University of Kansas Medical Center, and I'm also a LEND fellow. And I have really, really enjoyed all of this, um, this whole echo and really learning about the things that everyone's doing all over the state. And after COVID, I was, I mean, I have been unbelievably impressed with the districts and how well everybody has responded and, and been incredibly creative um, in doing what they're doing uh, to assist families. And I mean, Honestly, it's really helped us at KU as well to become even more creative with our families that we're seeing via telehealth. So we're all learning from each other, which I think is really uh, exciting. Thank you. And then last but not least, Michelle. Good morning. I'm Michelle Utt, and I am program manager for the Telehealth Rocks grant and um, work with these lovely ladies putting together this ECHO series, which has been um, really amazing. So I'm really happy everybody could join today. And as Lenny put in the um, chat box, please add your email to the chat box so that I can make sure that I'm getting back to people that weren't originally on my list. So thank you. All right, wonderful. You want to move forward the slide? And we've just kind of been using this as a guide um, since the um, since COVID has kind of come and transformed everything. So just the idea that 
Um, what Mr. Rogers says that anything is hu human is mentionable and anything that is mentionable can be more manageable. When we can talk about our feelings, they become less overwhelming, less upsetting and less scary. So we've really been trying to use that as a guide for um, working with our kids, um, you know, making sure we're being honest with them and letting them kind of talk through things. Um, and then also just as for each other being there and you guys have already done such a great job being open and honest and sharing some of those feelings. And um, again, when we all can get together, it can just be, it seems like it can be a little bit more manageable. So we're gonna move forward. We already kind of did the COVID check-in, I feel like, so we'll go past that. So we're gonna um, kind of go over again. So for you, those of you who are new, uh, this series started out um, very focused on behavior. And so we were calling it Function Fridays and working you know, specifically at um, helping you guys to create really um, individualized and intensive behavior plans for kids that are having really challenging behaviors based on um, the function. So, you know, kind of taking those functional behavior analysis and hopefully like helping you guys take those to the next level, um, gathering um, more specific and um, helpful data, uh, and then helping you guys kind of develop these individualized interventions for um, a child or the children that are really challenging um, in, in your school or in your district. And so um, we started out with that goal um, and then it, it obviously very, it transformed as things changed because, um, you know, we couldn't do the same kind of data collection um, that, that, you know, we had talked about at the beginning and we couldn't even do the same kind of interventions that we were talking about in the beginning because you're not with kids every day and they're not there all day. Um, so we still wanted to review with everybody again some of the content that was presented at the beginning because we feel like it's really valuable content. Um, and making sure that you guys are getting that piece that you signed up for, but then also really, you know, again, being flexible and how do we, how do we transform this and make this relevant for right now? Um, so, uh, the first, you know, the first session of content that we did, we really talked about functions of behavior and my take home messages from that were, um, that behavior is communication and that that's really what a functional behavior analysis is. It's what their kids are telling us what they need. The function of the behavior is what they need. Um, and so we need to find out what that is so that we can get them what they need in a more appropriate way. Um, so we talked about, you know, seat. So the, the kids need, they may need sensory input. They may need to escape from something that's too hard or too overwhelming or stressful. Um, they may need attention, um, which most uh, many, many of us do. And that's a, usually a very common function, but um, and, and attention could be a reaction. It could be um, kind of feeling in control or powerful. Um, and so um, just getting a kind of acknowledgement. So that, that's a big piece of kind of figuring out, do they need attention and how do we get that for them in an appropriate way? Um, oh, they might, they might need or want something tangible. Um, so, you know, they may be looking for a way to get a certain toy or an iPad or a snack or something like that. Um, and so how do we get them that in a more appropriate way? Um, and then we really also tried to kind of focus on trauma during this because I feel like a lot of times, um, you know, when people talk about really strict behavior analysis and FBAs, it doesn't always go with sort of, um, or it's hard to connect with the trauma informed um, care piece that, that everybody is um, rightfully talking about and focusing on. And so we talked about a lot about how um, FBAs can be trauma informed. And so, you know, that, that trauma may have been the cause of part of the behavior, it might have led to the behavior, but oftentimes other things are maintaining it. So they might have started something because of the trauma that they've experienced, but we might be giving it attention and we might be keeping it going. And so, um, you know, really thinking about that, that, that just because it was, it, it was a cause by a trauma, let's acknowledge that, let's try to address that trauma and support that child and family in processing it. But that doesn't mean we don't put together a consistent intervention that really helps them. And so, you know, if we know that attention is maintaining it or escape is maintaining it, how do we put something together that's really consistent so that they, they, you know, so we can address that behavior and support them in being more successful? And we know that with trauma, um, consistency, consistent responses is so important. And so, um, you know, just really thinking about that when, and I think there's, there's a whole other discussion about trauma now. <laughs> um, all of us have kind of experienced trauma and many of these kids are in much more challenging situations than we are. And so, um, again, how do we be thoughtful about that and be always thinking about that and incorporating that into the behavior plans we're creating, but still being really consistent with our consequences and our behavior plan so that they know what to expect and they can feel good 
um, and safe in those plans. Okay, I think I'll throw it over to the next group. Um, so the next session we talked about uh, antecedents and consequences. Um, I really liked uh, when Lenny and I were discussing about this topic and Lenny uh, used this really uh, great uh, terminology to describe some of the antecedents and consequences, which is big picture. I was, so my background is in behavioral analysis and I was talking about like setting events or establishing operations. Lenny was like, I think those like, you know, sound like uh, big pictures. So we need to look at the big pictures of you know, maybe the child comes comes in with, uh, you know, already with some existing conditions. Maybe their family situation. Maybe they uh, they were not having enough food, or maybe uh, their fa uh, their parents just had a big fight. All those type of things can be the big picture antecedents that um, very that are very important to what the, how the child may behave that day in the in the classroom. So. Uh, we may not be able to like always capture those things, but it's really important to take those uh, big picture antecedents into consideration of how this child's behavior is changing, uh, maybe at different days even. Um, so, but also we, we need to look at the immediate uh, antecedents. So think about when you do a <clears throat> functional behavior uh, assessment, uh, what happened right before the behavior. It might be the teacher is giving attention to another child. Maybe the teacher is giving uh, the child, uh, the students uh, some like instructions that the, the child doesn't really feel like really can uh, solve that ma math problem. What, whatever that is, we need to really capture that. And that often is more um, observable from your data collection perspective. Um, so it's really important to uh, read that down when you do a functional behavior assessment. Also, there's immediate and long-term consequences. So um, I feel like I want to back up, up a little bit. So when we talk about a functional behavior assessment, a lot of times we're looking at the ABC. So the A is the antecedent, the B is the behavior, and the C is the consequence. Uh, and uh, a lot of times, the antecedents and the consequences are very uh, important factors when we, when we determine the function of the behavior. Um, so, uh, so for example, when we do uh, a observation um, of a child's behavior in the classroom, we might write down each incidence of a certain behavior occurs. It might be the child burst out answers all the time, or the child tries to elope from the classroom. We want to capture what happened right before and right after that behavior, which is the immediate uh, uh, antecedents and consequence. At the same time, just like how important the big picture of antecedents are, the big picture consequence or long-term consequence can be very important as well. So let's say if a child um, was reprimanded after the child was trying to leave the classroom, that could be the immediate consequence. But there are some other consequences that might lead uh, the child's behavior change. For example, the child might be sent to the principal's office. So potentially, uh, it, it may look like at the first, maybe the a teacher's attention might be a really big factor of uh, the child's behavior. But if the child is being consistently sent to the principal's office, it might be that that escape from the classroom, from the instruction might play a bigger factor in how the child's behave. So those are the things that we want to capture and also collect enough data so that we can see whether there's a pattern. So that's another piece that we talked about, about data collection, sometimes conducting a functional behavior assessment and collecting uh, enough data can be really challenging because, uh, you know, you all are really busy and if you are a teacher and trying to collect the data, you have other students in the classroom you need to attend to and you need to teach. So um, we were talking about it's it is really important to be like really creative um, to with the data collection, it might be using 
uh, you know, some kind of app on your phone. It could be uh, like Katie uh, suggested, maybe you have some beans in your pocket and uh, you can move the beans from left pocket to the right pocket when the behavior happens. So just think about how that can be embedded in your uh, daily uh, routine so that it won't be so overwhelming that you won't be able to collect any data, but be realistic about what kind of data you can collect and any data is better than not, no data. So that's the most important take home message with the antecedents and the consequences. Next. Um, and then we spent some time talking about prevention and specifically during session four, we talked about visuals. We spent a, a whole session talking about this because they're unbelievably important. Um, and visuals can really help all students, they can help um, your students with particularly challenging behaviors and there's a variety of visuals that you can use um, and the big thing with visuals is that they are kind of a preventative measure to help a child understand maybe what's expected of them or what's coming or um, ways that they can earn rewards or ways that they can earn uh, next steps you know what, what what's their next step and so um, these are we, we went through a variety of different uh, visual supports but um, some of the big ones would be a visual schedule. So that just shows a child exactly what is coming. Um, uh, you know, what's, it might be in the morning and then it might be in the afternoon, or it really might just be for that particular assignment. Um, a reward chart. So allowing a student to um, view their rewards. You know, if I do these five things, then I can get this thing. Um, a five point scale allows for children to. Um, uh, their, you know, kind of uh, calculate their emotion and kind of where they're at. So if they're at a one, they're feeling pretty good. If they're at a five, they're about to, um, they're having a big, a big meltdown. Um, and then the first then, so this is super helpful for children to identify kind of what comes first and then what are they going to get. So um, first you do the worksheet and then you get to have iPad time or something like that. Um, and these really, that really draws upon um, it's called the pre-MAC principle, but, but just kind of, we do this for ourselves. First, if I mow the lawn, then I can have some chips or something like that. Um, using break cards, getting help, and problem solving cards. So this is just a way for a child to um, identify ways that they can escape from something, or if they are asking for help 100 times a day, then um, helping them identify, like, I can only ask for help these many times, and here's the steps that I can take before that. Um, the big things with visuals now that we've moved to virtual learning is that they're absolutely still effective. Um, we're still, we can definitely still be using these. Um, I'm sure that you all are doing this in your districts, but I have a patient um, that I see via telemed at KU and, and um, his uh, special education teacher and um, some of the people in his classroom have really created a bunch of visuals for him for home. Uh, to help him with this transition. And so um, one big thing that we often do it at KU when we're seeing children virtually is to share our screen and then create the visual with the family um, that way. And so the child is still involved in the visual, they're still understanding what's going on and then it can still be used. And so that's a, it's a really cool way to start using these a little bit more virtually. Um, Katie, I just want to add an, an yeah. example of how we can use like Zoom to do like a token board. <laughs> so we yeah. don't really have a like a physical token board but now, but like there's like different functions. For example, there's a whiteboard on Zoom. So we have been using like draw, draw like circles or whatever shapes. And then every time we can do it by either taking off the circles or drawing more circles when the child is getting more uh, tokens when they are working. It's such a, yeah, there's just a lot of really, really cool ways to use these visuals, even though we're not with children um, in, in person. Thank you guys for sharing that. I had a kiddo yesterday and I was trying to do like draw a five point scale on my whiteboard. And then he had a paper and he was drawing like his own faces on his own paper. And he, I mean, they were way better than mine. Um, but I thought it was really fun because it was really interactive. And again, it was like using visuals and he was getting to create them. And um, I don't know that we would have been doing that together had we been actually in person. You know, it would have been a different yeah. experience had we been in person. So that was cool. 
Um, the other thing I, you know, I love how you guys pointed out that they're still just, just as important, if not more important. And so I have another patient who, um, he's in high school or middle school. And so, and, and you know, they were, they kept saying, well, just, just, you know, sign into your app and then you can see all the assignments that you have due. And I was like, well, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like that's still really overwhelming. That's visual, but it's really overwhelming to have like all these classes and all these assignments. And so I was like, how could we make even more visuals that are more specific to each class? for this situation because he has less support in like sort of managing through all that. So just thinking about, you know, there might be times where you even, you even need more visuals in this, in this sort of situation because no one's sitting there with him able to kind of go through it with him. So how do we organize that into like a better, yeah. more manageable checklist? So those are all really good points. Something else I was just going to mention is that um, visuals are also your face too at times. And so there's one way to really kind of manage that if you're having difficulty, um, not responding to a child or not reacting uh, with a facial expression, you can just turn your camera off. Um, and that's another kind of way to just not, not give any response to those kinds of things. All right, we'll move on. So in session five, we were continuing the discussion of prevention um, and talking more about how your relationship with the kids that you work with is actually like a huge part of being able to prevent challenging behaviors. Um, if you think about kind of like the best boss you've ever had or the best coach you've ever had, it was usually someone that you had a good foundation and a good relationship with before they started giving you demands or asking you to do certain things. And so Thinking about attention, not just as something we're gonna give contingent on good behavior, but also just filling up someone's bucket in advance. Or the other analogy I like to use is putting coins in your relationship bank, um, so that when you need to give a direction or have an expectation, you're making that withdrawal, you wanna make sure you have plenty of money in that relationship bank um, so that you can do that. Um, and an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, this is the idea that like, if you put in that time with connecting, especially with some of your more challenging kids, of just spending like five minutes sitting together with kind of non-directive play first thing in the morning, you would be shocked at how much that can, how much time that's gonna save you over the course of the school day of not having to manage as much attention seeking or negative behaviors. Um, so we talked a little bit about some specific things that we can do if you're doing that kind of relationship building preventative time, um, which is we talked about doing the P's and the Q's, so kind of if you're doing that non-directed kind of play time with a kid, trying to avoid things like asking a lot of questions, which can sound like you're not approving maybe of what they're doing, um, making it, giving them a little bit of that control back um, when you're playing with them and it's really just this relationship building time, don't give directions, kind of quash that need to lead and sort of pull back and allow them to have a little bit more control because this is the time they can have it. Um, and then also making sure that when you're doing that relationship building time, kind of quiet the criticism or kind of pull back from the need to say like, oh, no, it doesn't go like that or no, I don't think that's a good idea or anything like that. Um, just kind of sit back and enjoy them, um, you know, give them lots of specific praise um, like, oh, thank you so much for picking that up when it fell down. I love when you pick up after yourself. Um, like what a creative and cool idea to make the building like that or whatever. Um, so lots of that specific praise, either for their own kind of ideas and creativity or those big picture behaviors that you want to see more of, like sharing, picking up after yourself, being respectful of possessions. Um, everyone loves to feel heard. Um, and being able to paraphrase and say back um, what a kid says to you is a way of making them feel really heard. Um, and this is a great skill to use all the time. We always talk about this is one of those foundational skills for a therapist too, um, not just for pediatric therapy, but also for adult care too. Um, so when someone's saying something to you like, oh, I'm so frustrated with this math assignment, all it takes is saying back like, you are super frustrated by this math right now. And it doesn't have to be a problem solving thing. It doesn't have to be, but you can do X, Y, and Z. Just say it back. And then that can really help someone feel heard. And similarly, if you're doing that kind of non-directive play, um, even them just saying like, um, you know, the, the horse is going in the barn, you say, oh, you're putting the horse in the barn. Just that little bit of reflection lets them know you are there for them, you are connected to them, and you really care about what they're telling you. Um, and then the last of those P's is pointing out, and this is just kind of like a non-judgmental description of what they're actively doing. So like, oh, I see that you're looking for a new toy, or um, oh, I, I see that you're putting the horse in the barn, or whatever it is. So just literally describing what they're doing as if you were a sportscaster. Um, and again, this is just letting them know, hey, I'm fully engaged in this time with you. You have my attention. Um, 
I'm interested in what you're doing. And it can also kind of help them focus. A lot of these kids we're talking about have a real hard time with attention and concentration. And some of this narrating of just pointing out what they're doing while they're playing with you can really help improve their attention and focus. Um, I think there are a lot of ways too that we need more of this kind of building relationships over Zoom. Um, and so finding ways to kind of build that in preventatively during your, um, your time with students, I think would really get you a lot kind of in the long run. And I, I, we didn't really mention this, um, but we just had, we had so many wonderful case presentations throughout um, this series of um, participants that shared their cases of, of their particular students. And um, Jennifer shared some really cool ways how, um, you know, her school is continuing to um, kind of, you know, provide that relationship building with kiddos, bringing, you know, eating lunch kind of one on the porch and one on the sidewalk um, with, with special, special kids and um, that the kids really enjoy. Um, and we also had a great uh, case example before all of this started where I, I, I hope I'm saying this right, but I think they, they built in sort of a check-in time where the child got to like check in with the teacher at the very beginning of class and kind of tell all their stories and, you know, kind of get that time to feel heard. And it really had made a huge difference with that child. So um, again, just thinking about how to sort of build that into these behavior plans and whether you're doing it virtually or in person. Katie and Skylar, I think this was you guys. Am I there? Can you guys hear me? Katie, do you want to take this over? I cannot. Yeah. I'm, my screen is messed up. I'm sorry. That's okay. So um, <clears throat> the bit, oops, what happened here? There we go. Um, so the best kind of inter intervention is the one that's focused on the function of the behavior. And so that's why first we want to identify why, why the child is doing what they're doing, what's the function of what they're doing, and then um, focusing our interventions on that function. And so um, attention is often a big, um, a big reason why children are doing things. And that can be positive attention, that can be negative attention. Um, and so we really want to focus our interventions on um, whatever that function is. And so if the attention, if the attention is the function, we want to catch kids being good. So whatever that looks like for the child. So if they're usually pretty rambunctious and they're moving around and, and you're constantly saying, Johnny, please sit down, Johnny, please sit down. Um, we really want to focus our attention on when Johnny is sitting down. Um, and so really only giving attention to the behaviors that are expected of the child and not giving attention to the behaviors that are not expected. Um, a big takeaway from this session is that behavior likely will get worse before it gets better. So if you're receiving a lot of attention for one behavior and then that attention just completely goes away, um, often kids really amp up their behavior. They make it gets way, way worse to try and get some attention for that behavior before it starts to get better. And so um, if you're talking with parents or teachers about this, um, Often people will come back and say, it's not working, it's getting so much worse. Um, and there's a, there's a word for that, an extinction burst. And so um, that's how we know that it's working, really, is that uh, if, if the behavior gets way worse, we know that the, the intervention is working and that uh, the child's trying to get your response, uh, that it, they're trying to receive that attention by ramping up their behavior. Um, and but it another, be better eventually. <laughs> yes, it will, it will. That's the other big kicker. <laughs> um, and the other big kicker here, now that we're virtual, is that you really can provide function-based interventions virtually. And so uh, if a child is, is in, your, in your virtual classroom um, and they're doing things to get attention, um, like writing words on the screen or making funny faces, uh, like I said earlier, one thing that you can do is completely remove that attention is just, you know, either turning off their screen, turning off your screen, uh, whatever it is, so that whatever they're doing uh, isn't, you know, they're not, they're not going to, nobody's even going to see it. Um, and so, but also really, really providing the biggest kicker here 
So if you're going to remove attention from something, you have to be providing the attention to the positive behavior. So we really have to be paying attention um, to whenever that child is, is providing uh, behavior that's expected. And often it's really short. It's a very, very quick behavior that you have to be paying attention to really closely to catch. Um, and again, uh, educators are unbelievably creative, incredibly innov innovative, and committed to their students. And they, you all are doing incredible jobs um, really keeping this all going, even virtually. Um, I had a teacher friend that just mentioned that she was really going to miss the mute button on Zoom uh, yeah. <laughs> when they're back in, in person um, classes. And I thought that was pretty funny because in some ways it's almost easier to do that sort of like function based like ignore, right? Because you, <laughs> you can just mute them, um, which you can't do in real life. So um, in some ways you can do this a little bit better. So it was kind of a funny um, observation, I think. I think a big thing virtually right now is that we all are looking for attention. I mean, every single person is looking for some way to, to connect with people, um, especially our kids. They're, you know, they might be at home and might, their parents might be working all day. And they were receiving a decent amount of attention when they went to school, and now they're really not receiving that attention. So their behavior might ramp up pretty significantly um, because they're looking for some sort of um, interaction uh, with their peers or with their teachers whoever that is. And then um, the last thing we had discussed was talking about safety planning. Um, and specifically, we were talking about safety planning as you could um, do it over, um, uh, over video conferencing. But I think all these ideas can still apply to um, in the traditional brick and mortar classroom as well. Um, so we talked about having an actual crisis plan. Um, and um, Dr. Bellinger and some, and some others from the team made some really wonderful resources that are available on the telehealthrocks.org website. And we'll throw that in the chat box too for people who are new to this, um, fun, this uh, Behavior Echo series. Um, so the pink one is an, is an example of a crisis plan um, that includes ideas for how to preventatively manage eloping, self-harm, aggression, and then um, unsafe behavior from an adult towards a child. Um, but I think the other thing, too, is you can have all these plans for the crisis situation, but again, we need to plan for the prevention. So similarly, especially when we're thinking about families who might be at risk um, during this time where their kids aren't going to school on a regular basis, thinking about how can we make a family support plan to help keep everyone in a, in a healthy place um, as far as parent coping goes as well so that we feel like um, they'll be able to manage when ch children's behavior becomes more challenging. So we talked about having healthy routines. This is important for us, too, when we're talking about self-care, right? Um, thinking about things that, you know, families might already be doing for daily coping and capitalize on their existing strengths. Thinking about, well, what are the warning signs, either from the child or for parents themselves, that there might be getting triggered or, or escalating a situation? And for those warning signs and triggers, what are going to be the coping skills, things you can do immediately to kind of bring yourself back down, bring the kid back down or bring the parent back down so they're ready um, and able to um, be present and be calm again. Um, who are the people who can support you um, during, if you guys really need it, um, during a time of crisis? And also, what are my community resources? And I think coming up with some of these things proactively, just having that and knowing that a family has that as a resource can be a way to help them not need it. And that's ultimately what our goal is, that people don't necessarily need to use these crisis plans. But coming up with it, if you don't have it, then you're more likely to be like, oh, no, I really wish we had that. We needed it. But if you come with it in advance, that might help people um, really feel like strong and able to handle these challenging situations. Um, so I think what we want to do next is talk some more about self-care, because I mean, we talked about all the things, amazing things that you guys are doing for your communities, but um, you have, you can't pour from an empty cup. You have to take care of yourself first. And so thinking about, um, I'd love for people to either, you know, unmute yourself and share or throw in the chat box things that you're doing for self-care. Um, I was making a little list myself of what are the things that have worked well for me. Um, and some of them, I think, have been said a lot. Routine we know is important. We know it's important to get out of your PJs, get dressed and showered every day so you feel like you're doing something. Um, I've actually started walking my commute to work each day. I saw that as a tip online. Um, and I love it, actually, because it helps me feel like consistent and like routine based. Um, people who know me well know that I, I walk to commute. It's about a mile for me each way. And so every morning at the time I usually would go, I just go ahead and walk to work and back. 
Um, and I, it's, it's a great way for me to get out of the house and feel like there's a distinct difference um, kind of rather than just walking into my spare bedroom where I'm using as my home office right now, I feel more like I commuted it. I'm doing something different. The other thing that's worked really well for me, I'm also a really silly person. And you know what? There's no one here to judge me. Um, <laughs> so I can be as silly as I want. Um, so even things like I do jumping jacks between closing my notes so that I'm getting some physical activity and it makes me smile. And um, that helps my mood so much is just being really silly. Um, we've done a lot of dance parties and that brings a smile to my face too. So being able to just be silly and active has really done wonders for my own kind of mental health. The other thing that's helped me personally is just saying the obvious, like, I don't like this. I don't like having to see people in masks when they're walking around. I don't like the idea that things are going to change. And it's not necessarily something that needs to be a problem to be solved, but just saying the obvious that this is hard and I don't like it has helped me a lot too, to feel like, okay, that's not weighing on me as much anymore. Um, and another thing that's helped me a lot too personally is I'm actually not from Kansas originally. Um, and most of my family and really close um, people are scattered across the US. Um, and one positive thing that's come out of this is, you know, I can connect and I do to the people who, I, who are living close to me, but also I can connect to the people who are closest in my heart who actually happen to be really far away. Um, so I've been able to do more regular face-to-face -face Zoom things with um, my close friends and family um, who are really far away and feel connected even more to them in this really challenging time. Um, and we schedule a social hour here so that we were making sure to be really proactive about um, scheduling in those social activities so that I continue to feel connected to people outside of my immediate household. Um, but I would love to hear ideas from other people because some of my own ideas are things I had heard from other people and I've adopted it for myself. So I'm interested in other people's ideas too. I may go just really quickly and then I may I may just call on people randomly because I feel like you guys probably have good ideas and <laughs> we did tell you to prepare this um so I was just gonna like what, what's been the most helpful for me I think is um walks and taking walks without my children so um it, it's really hard for me because I feel like I'm like if I'm outside I need to get my kids outside and like we need to be like doing something like fun or you know but it's been like huge for me that I have some time for myself because I have none. Um, you know, like you're from morning to night, you're with your, like my husband's here, my kids are here. Um, and so like being outside for 20 to 30 minutes, um, just with myself has been huge. Um, and I try to, you know, it's good exercise, it's vitamin D, it's sunshine. Um, but I also try to do, you know, little things that we know help like some gratitude and thinking about what I'm grateful for. Um, and some mindfulness, just sort of noticing the, it's been a beautiful April. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but just so many um, trees flowering and blue skies. And um, so really trying to, to notice those things. And then the other thing that's been helpful for me is really trying to um, kind of reset my expectations as far as for work that like, you know, like maybe all I can do today is five to six hours. It's, I, it can't be a full day. I just can't. And that's okay. Um, and kind of the same with my kids. It may not be, um, you know, we may not get everything done that I would like to do, but but we're just going to do the best that we can. Um, and I see Jennifer. Jennifer, you want to share what you chatted in? Sure. Um, mine has been kind of a, a little bit of the concept of the cleaning up. You know, everybody's cleaning everything right now. Well, I kind of decided to start kind of cleaning out our freezer and all of the screenshotted recipes I've taken. And I don't know who some of these people are, but what the directions were to make this food and what it ended up being are not even close to each other. Oh. So some of it has been like good experiments, others not so great. So um, also my husband has never done a garden before. He was a city boy. And so we had, you know, we've done like patio gardening, but we actually got a rototiller and ground up some ground and he's going to learn how to do a real garden this year. Awesome. I've heard that a bunch, like having something sort of living to nurture or, you know, like kind of have that hope. Um, and, you know, that see that productivity is, is a really nice way to take care of yourself. I'm going to call on Kathy. Yeah. <laughs> Kathy. Oh, you're muted, Kathy. Click your little mute button. There you go. Perfect. Um, so I come back to the basics of what I think are foundational for all health and wellness, and that is how well you're sleeping, 
what's your nutrition like and how are you moving your body and um, those are the first things I tend to check in with especially during this time because I think they're also the things that can get out of whack so um, like you I have really been enjoying walking with my dog I've been doing that a whole lot um, I also kind of was thinking like I have a good friend of mine who um, has been fostering dogs which is that she can't really have a dog permanently but um, she has fostered like four dogs now during this time and managed I guess because she's posting them all over social media to get them adopted pretty quickly so that idea of nurturing something I think is is really helpful but I also kind of recognize like I think for some people that over functioning kind of kicks in during times like this like I'm gonna clean out my freezer I'm gonna paint something I'm but I think also acknowledging that some people aren't going to over function they're going to be more like reflective mm -hmm. and that time on the couch doing nothing and not thinking is just as valuable at times as that person that's really digging into some other things that it's just we just function differently mm -hmm. and that's okay it's neat to have that time that you may not have you know normally yeah. to, <laughs> to do that great thank you for sharing um and then i think beth is next i'm gonna share next Sorry. Oh, Get off the couch. Um, well, I am lucky that I live in a small um, town area, and so I get to have connections with um, friends and who happen to also be like our school counselors. And so we get to talk about our work stress and our personal stress, and we're all close right here. So that's been nice. Um, we live on a farm, and I have four boys, so we're doing a lot of active stuff outside. We have a garden every year. We raise cattle and other animals and we have chickens so we're super busy out here just kind of doing some of the fun things that they want to do um, my 13 and 14 year old built a greenhouse last week so we're out there doing some fun gardening in their greenhouse and just doing all kinds of farming livestock stuff here so that's what we do lots of outside lots of physical and just lots of fun projects that we never really got to before that's really awesome thank you for sharing all right anybody else one of our michelle katie alice anybody else i have really been um just trying i've been a little bit more reflective and um and i take a lot of walks my dog i even say the word and he's like i'm done i'm done with you um <laughs> and will kind of go away but i kind of agree that being outside and just um kind of trying to be in, in open air. I live uh, right downtown in Kansas City in a pretty small apartment with um, a lot of animals and my husband. And so um, it's been really important for me to take those walks alone as well, Skylar. And so um, that's uh, been something that I've really been doing. I've also been reading a lot. And so that's been um, kind of helpful to just take my mind somewhere else. Um, and so those are kind of the big things that I've been doing. Um, and while I'm working, the biggest thing that I do is I still get up every hour <laughs> and move around because uh, there comes a point that just sitting here is, uh, it's, I mean, it's truly exhausting. And so I get up and I move around uh, at least once an hour. So those are kind of the big, big things that I've been doing. Thank you. Katie, you can do jumping jacks with me. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Maybe I'll just FaceTime you and we'll do some jumping checks together. <laughs> Alice or Michelle, you guys want to share? Yeah. Um, I, I just see J Jennifer posted something about uh, <laughs> she has to type the walk word because the dog may <laughs> go wild. <laughs> that is really cute. <laughs> yeah. So I, um, I feel like I've been trying to get outside if I can when the weather is nice. It's really, um, I was talking to my husband yesterday um, because uh, I'm originally uh, from China. So basically, um, you, you know, we are kind of going through different phases and chi when like things were really bad in China, it was like December, January or February. So like it was rainy winter and cold and everything. So I was talking to my husband about, I was like, you know, it's really, um, it's not a good thing that we have this, but the fact that, you know, everything is, uh, 
you know, it's sunny and the flowers are blooming and uh, everything's green. I feel like, you know, um, it actually makes things a little bit better that we can actually go outside and uh, take walks or uh, do things. Um, it's not like we have to be stuck in the house all the time. So that's really something I feel like grateful about. Um, also um, trying to exercise a little bit. I mean, I, I, I had more like higher goals for myself. I was like, I'm at home all the time. I should do more exercise. And uh, I didn't. <laughs> and I was like, that's okay. <laughs> but uh, some kind of leave it for myself and uh, don't be too critical of myself. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that's kind of what I have been trying to do to do self care. Awesome. Thank you. I think that that's so um, important to give yourself that grace because I think a lot of us had these big aspirations of like, oh, I, you know, because I'm moving in a few months. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to pack my house during this time. I haven't gotten anything done. Um, and so I think that that's really important to give yourself a little bit of that, you know, just kind of grace to say like, oh, it's just not the time to be, uh, so that I'm going to do that. And that's okay. All right, if you haven't shared, just type in one thing in the chat box um, that you've done, like walks or meditation or I don't know, um, dance parties, just chat something in for us. We definitely wanted to, oh, I saw someone, Laurel said embroidery. Um, that's pretty, I like that, that's a good. Started working out again, that's awesome. I think, again, that's so important, especially when we're not going anywhere to have that physical activity and. Um, and I also awesome. think it's good to acknowledge, that, like what Katie was saying, that we're going to go through phases of what we feel like is working for us, because there's going to be times where you we're going to be like super active and like I have all these goals, and then there's going to be times where we just want to curl up on the couch in our sweats and just say, you know, screw it. And so, <laughs> it, you know, we it's going it, to this has been a long process. My husband and I were just talking that it's been over a month about a month and a half now really since the weirdness kind of began and that it's going to be phases yeah that's how we deal with it all right and then nancy shared as well um close the laptop by four i've heard that you know making sure you're putting those boundaries um walk away um yeah and not doing too much i think that's i think that's um that's really, really important. So those are all really great suggestions. Um, thank you guys for being willing to share and to participate in this with us. Again, this has been a really um, special series just because of everything that's happened. And we really feel like we've gotten to know you all and grow with you and learn from you. Um, and so hopefully you got a little bit of tips and, um, and information about behavior and um, functions of behavior and behavior plans, but also just um, we really appreciate the community and um, hopefully you're taking some ideas for self-care and some of that inspiration of just how awesome you all are. Um, we are going to, um, all, have, all of these sessions are recorded, so if you would like to um, watch any of the other ones, you're welcome to do that. Um, that, that Michelle's going to send all of that out, um, and she's going to um, send out all the resources that we've been talking about. Um, we, we really are interested in the sort of self-care for educators. We know you guys are busy and everybody's probably ready to be done with the school year, but we might be reaching out to you to even think about making a short little video about self-care or something that's worked for you because we, we like the idea of like sending that out to our whole listserv because um, we have, you know, people from um, schools all over the state of Kansas um, and we were thinking, is it better to have like another echo that somebody, you know, people have to jump onto Zoom again and it's like another thing or is it better to just like send out little tips, you know, or like little videos or little ideas of um, things that have worked for other people and other educators um, across the state. And so if you'd be interested in, um, you know, recording one of those or working with us on one of those, please let us know because um, we feel like it's really important to support you guys in some way. And I don't know if the best way is another Zoom meeting. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't know, maybe it is. And if it is, please let us know. Um, but if it's not, you know, again, we're, um, we're, we're here to be creative and think of some other ways to support you. Um, somebody just mentioned, will you do this again next year? Yes, we're planning to do another Function Fridays next year um, to kind of do this sort of behavior planning, behavior um, focused echo um, in the fall. 
again, I'm not sure what that's going to look like, but, but please, you know, keep us in mind. I know that Michelle has everybody's emails and we'll keep sending you information about all the different echoes we're doing. I think one of the, the, mo the ones we're doing soon is the uh, medical complexities, Michelle. Is that the one that's next? Um, yes, so I am pulling together um, a medical complexities echo with uh, Dr. Smith, Dr. Ryan Smith out of uh, KU's Pillars program and Dr. Emily Goodwin out of the uh, Beacon program out of Children's Mercy. So it's a partnership between those two doctors to um, really target uh, school staff about medical complexities and, and students with medical complexities. So, so if there'll be more to come on that. I'll include everyone that was on this echo in, to invite them on the next echo. We're always thinking, trying to think of new ones. So if there's things, if there's certain topics that, you know, we haven't done or that you think you, that would be helpful, let us know about that too, because we're always trying to put things together that are most beneficial for you guys. So we'll definitely keep you on our listserv. And then we're a little bit over, so I'll let you go. But we, again, we really enjoyed this time and um, we hope to see you again soon someday.